Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to The Briefing Room. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your moderator for today's event, folks, in which we're going to try to connect these two massive worlds out there in the universe of information management. Yes, indeed. The topic for today, the great divide, bridging structured and unstructured data. So we're talking about all this big data stuff, but we're also talking about the small data, all the usual old data, if you will. Of course, it's not very small, and it's certainly not insignificant. It is the entire world of business intelligence and even business analytics that we've been talking about for 25 to 30 years, at least in this growing industry of information management. Let's go through a couple of housekeeping notes. There's a slide about yours truly and enough about me. So the mission, as many of you know, is to reveal the essential characteristics of enterprise software. So what we do in this show is we pair a vendor with an analyst in the space, usually an independent analyst who's been around for a while and really knows his way or her way around, and we reveal a live analyst briefing for the benefit of a virtual studio audience. I can tell you that the questions from our audience really do help drive excellent content on this show. So don't be shy and don't be afraid to get into the weeds. We have two real experts on the line here today to talk about this technology, which really is finally on the verge of being able to unify some very different worlds of data. So, of course, we have this structured world mostly in relational databases, but we have all these other things happening out there, hence this concept of big data. And it really is throwing a bit of a monkey wrench into the works. A uh, quick comment on the month. We're talking about analytics this month, so we're talking about how you can derive analysis and get insights from getting this synthesized view of structured data and multi-structured, as some people refer to it, big data, whether it be social media or sensors or log files or any number of other things that come from the operations of a business usually. A lot of this is machine-generated data or machine-generated data caused by people doing things like engaging in social media. So as you can imagine, if you think about how wild and unwieldy so much of that big data really is, that's when you understand and appreciate just how complicated the challenge is of trying to synthesize all this information while still maintaining the kinds of rigor you have in the world of structured data, things like data governance, things like data models, information architectures, all of these concepts which have been refined over many years now and lots and lots of people have been working on them. Of course, just a whole ocean of innovations over the last 20 years in terms of being able to access data, transform data, load data, process, analyze, deliver, etc. It's a huge industry out there and this new thing or relatively new thing I suppose called big data is really creating a lot of opportunities and a lot of hurdles for people to be able to work with this stuff. So that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about how we can bring all this stuff together and get a big picture view. So yes, I will, as always, distribute the slides. I'll put that in the chat feature for those of you who have just dialed in. We're very excited, folks, to have John O'Brien of Radiant Advisors. John has been around this industry for quite a few years, and he knows database just about as well as anybody out there. He worked very many years with Foster Hinshaw, who, of course, is often referred to as the grandfather or the godfather of data warehousing or certainly of the appliance space. Foster is a really, really nice guy, and he was a true visionary. He's still out there talking to people, making some things happen. So Teradata, of course, is known for its analytical data solutions. It is the, uh, it is the powerhouse in the data warehousing industry. I don't think there's any doubt about that. They go head-to-head -head with the big guys like IBM and and others, Oracle certainly in the space. But as you know, the whole space of data warehousing is expanding as well. There's even a new mid-market database data warehouse that's coming out. There are lots of things happening in the field of data warehousing. But Teradata, no doubt, has been the sort of Cadillac of data warehousing. And a while ago, they bought Asterdata. And we're going to learn about what Asterdata does and how after data plays a role in being able to bridge these worlds of structured and unstructured data. So it's very interesting stuff. We're going to hear from Steve Woolidge. He is a senior director over at Teradata's Aster Center for Innovation. He's a real evangelist for the company's analytic platform. 
and uh, he's responsible for making people know what it does. So what a perfect segue. I'm going to go ahead and hand the keys to the WebEx to you, Steve, and uh, just click anywhere on that slide. Use the down arrow on your keyboard and take us through it. Great. Thanks, Derek. And just let me know you can hear me okay. I had to do a phone switch here. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is I'd like to give folks on the phone that aren't familiar with Aster a quick intro to Terry and Aster now that we're part oh. of the family. Your, your audio is kind of cutting out. Is that like a speakerphone or something? Uh, how's this? Any better? It's a little bit yeah, better. Yeah, it's yeah. It's okay, go as ahead. Good as I can get. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. So anyway, I wanted to give uh, that back and talk about our vision of a unified big data architecture, and then talk specifically about a new product that we announced back in June at the Hadoop Summit called SQL H, and describing how that helps analysts bridge the gap for data that's in Hadoop. Okay. So I'll build this slide out a little bit. Teradata Aster, for people that aren't aware, is a company that was started in 2005. It really came out of Stanford University and some work that our founders were doing in the distributed computing labs to build an infrastructure that leverages a new construct called MapReduce for processing large amounts of data in more procedural ways and building that on top of a relational database to bring to market a commercial way to do really data science or advanced analytics at scale, which supports SQL, but also extends it through more procedural analytic operators and functions uh, to deliver new insights on new types of data that are out there that may or may not fit really well into a relational database. So multi-structured data, I'll describe what I mean by that. And there's a number of companies that have been implementing this technology to solve different types of problems. A real quick view of the platform itself from Teradata Aster. We call it the Teradata Aster MapReduce platform, and think of it as three layers. So on the bottom layer, we have a relational database, which is an MPP scale-out architecture to run on commodity hardware. We've also built that into an appliance configuration now as part of Teradata. It also runs on Amazon Web Services. Again, it's relational, but because of the MapReduce implementation, it's easily extended for non-relational or multi-structured types of data. On top of that is the processing layer. So we have SQL as a language that works on the database, obviously, but also the SQL MapReduce framework, which is a patented technology that we've developed that allows us to then build analytic functions on top of that in the third layer. So we have 50 pre-built analytic functions which leverage the SQL MapReduce framework as well as a development environment so that you have not only out-of-the-box functions, but if you want to build specialized analytic functions to solve specific business problems, you can do that, but then expose it to the analyst through SQL and standard business intelligence tools. One example of a customer is Barnes & Noble. They've been doing a lot in the book and media business for a long time. Data warehousing and BI has been part of their DNA, but they wanted to be able to ingest and incorporate more of the digital channels. So Aster has been implemented to help them more quickly parse and process and analyze web logs as well as information from the Nook e-readers so they can provide a view of consumer preferences and behavior across digital channels and provide a more personalized experience, be able to attribute the different marketing offers they run in different channels and figure out what's the most effective channel to reach their consumers. Uh, and the thing they've found with Aster is that their analysts can be productive, much more productive, 30 to 40x more productive, not only because of the performance, because of, but also because of the analytic capabilities, which make it easier to do more sophisticated views across digital channels. So that kind of segues into this idea of different data types and, and big data. So everybody's got a definition of big data. I'll just say that, of course, volumes is one thing, but what is most interesting is as you start talking about the complexity and the variety of the different data types that are being generated, whether it's video, Twitter streams, it could be JSON files, you know, uh, web click stream, machine-generated data, and it's really interactions. I think I heard a stat that for every transaction or touch point you have 
at a point of sale, there's something like 50 interactions that are uh, spawned from that. So there's a, this explosion of data, and a lot of it has to do with machine-generated data that comes out of that. And what challenges the organizations are finding is they don't understand necessarily what's the value in all those interactions. So, you know, the classic world of business intelligence and data warehousing has been that IT works with the business to figure out what are the questions that they're trying to ask. They build the BI reports and the data models and the, the structures that allow them to answer those questions in a repeatable and structured way. Um, and in that model, in some ways, it's really just capturing what data is needed. But if you're thinking about the big data world and all these new data types that are out there, IT doesn't want to be the bottleneck. They want to provide an infrastructure that allows companies to explore data to figure out what are the questions worth answering in the first place. They may not know what to put into the data models and what to structure in the warehouse. So this idea of data discovery and bridging the SQL world, if you will, with this MapReduce processing flexibility so that you can ingest these more unstructured or unknown uh, structures of data that are out there in a more flexible way without necessarily building out sophisticated ETL trains and um, data models in advance is a great way to help companies figure out and discover what the value is out there. One example of that and how MapReduce is applied is pathing or pattern matching and looking for sequences between rows of data. And that could be anything from web clickstream to look at behavior across a website. It could be looking for behavior across digital channels, people that go from search to the website to online or something else. And, um, you know, it could be other, really any type of interaction or time series analysis. To do that in SQL requires a lot of self-joins. It requires a lot of sophisticated SQL programming. And that doesn't perform very well, and it doesn't scale very well. So there's other ways to skim that cat. This is a busy slide. I won't read through all of it. It's available for download. But this is an example of a customer we worked with who was trying to do pathing analysis across their website to look at what were the three pages somebody looks at over time before taking a certain action. They were running that in a SQL database. And what we did was we ported that to a SQL MapReduce function. And there was something like a 6x performance improvement, which is kind of cool. What's really interesting is that as this analyst wanted to expand the scope of the analysis and look at four pages or eight pages or 12 pages, number one, it was easy to change that scope of analysis. It's just a parameter through a BI tool, uh, really in a SQL statement, that can then invoke the MapReduce engine underneath. Um, but it also does all of that still within a single pass of the data. So it's less code, it's more performant, and it provides flexibility to the analyst to do that data discovery to look at behavior across the website without incurring a lot of overhead. And that's really the advantage of MapReduce is to provide those types of sophisticated analytics without requiring a degree in, in distributed computing. Um, so, you know, all of that to say that there are different technologies out there and it's not an always one size fits all type of approach. So organizations have invested a lot in reporting BI and data warehousing, but there's an opportunity to uncover value from new data types through new analytics. So our vision at Teradata is to provide a unified big data architecture which stitches together the data warehousing world as well as providing this discovery platform. And then underneath that, provide a buffer, really, a place to stage data so that you can capture it at scale, do some refining and crunching that down. And if I kind of pull the covers off of what this looks like then, this is really the technology recommendations that we make and, and start to have conversations with our customers about, you know, Hadoop is this new thing that's out there that has MapReduce implemented on a file system. What are the right places to use that strength, the scale-out architecture and the, the cost footprint that's there? Um, but what are the other areas where that will plug into the infrastructure? So one of the things we'll talk about today are how these systems are connected, what are the specialized workloads they support, and what are the, some of the new innovations that we're building with the Hadoop community through things like SQLH, and what does that provide in terms of value to the end customer. So in terms of data connectivity, every database vendor out there has ways to move data between Hadoop and their system. We've got that too, but we really see the opportunity to help analysts get 
direct access to the data in Hadoop without having to replicate it all the time between systems. And if you look at some research that's come out from ESG recently back in April, they talked about what are some of the barriers for organizations that are trying to do big data analytics. And there's certainly a lot of technology considerations, but the thing I hear over and over again is that it's also a lack of training, a lack of skilled professionals, and sometimes time constraints on the tools and the, the people that are out there. They don't necessarily want to have to learn new technology. So the more we can plug new technology into the ecosystem that's already there, the better it will be for the end customer in terms of the, the total cost of ownership. So really that's what we talk about is how do we bridge that gap for the business analyst to be able to access some of these new data types that companies are looking to stage or store in Hadoop. And SQL H is an innovation that we built together with the Apache Hadoop community. Uh, Horton Works was this company that really was driving a new project called Hadoop Catalog, and I'll talk about how we've integrated with that. But what this really does is after SQL H provides that view to data in Hadoop through a standard ANSI SQL interface. It allows companies to leverage their existing tool sets, the people they've got in place, and it also allows some of these new SQL MapReduce analytic functions and applications that we've built to run on top of those data sets. So it provides not only faster access to data at scale, but also a lot of valuable new analytics to make it faster and easier to find new insights in the business. So if you think about the big data architecture, as I described earlier, I think there's some gaps. From an analyst perspective, they're trying to get at the data that's in Hadoop or HDFS. And what we often see is that it requires a lot of custom code or development on the part of a data scientist or a data engineer through the MapReduce interface or leveraging tools like PIG and Hive, which certainly provides some levels of abstraction. But in that world, IT is really the optimizer. There is no concept in a file system of a query optimizer or data locality. So performance becomes an issue and the ability to use straight BI tools to do machine-generated SQL. So what we've really focused on is taking the SQL and the SQL MapReduce interface that we have and really extending that to allow business analysts to access data in Hadoop through the SQL H connector so it looks like just another table in a database and they can just write their SQL or use their BI tools without having to think about it and have those data connections be automatic and maintained. So how this works under the covers, as I mentioned, Hadoop Catalog, or H Catalog, is a new project uh, under the Apache Foundation, which is really a metadata repository that links different sub-projects like Hive and Pig through a standard uh, library or catalog of how data is stored across these different systems, so that if you understand how the data is stored, you can access it through a standard interface like SQL through the SQL H adapter that we built to support BI tools and, and standard JDBC and ODBC connectors. So another level down then, what's happening is the analyst can access data. It's a view into data within Hadoop through Astro SQL H, and we can push down filtering now. So instead of moving all the data from Hadoop into Astro and, and replicating it in two different systems, you can just on the fly have a query that's generating saying that if I want to look at clickstream data from Hadoop for a certain date range, we can push down that filter to Hadoop and bring back just the data that's needed to complete that query. Uh, we persist that in memory for the analyst to run that query at, the, at that moment, and they could persist it then within Astro if they choose to, to be able to do other exploration on top of it, or could, they can just let it expire so that you don't incur the space of the data uh, that you're bringing in, but it allows you to access that data as needed on the fly. Um, the thing to point out is that there is no MapReduce processing happening uh, on the Hadoop side within this configuration. So we're direct accessing data within HDFS and pulling it back in. All the analytic processing is happening in memory within Aster. So there's performance improvement there. We're not going through the Hive interface, which incurs some latency because everything described in Hive through that declarative interface is translated into a MapReduce job running in Hadoop. And I'll talk about some of the performance things later, but we feel this is a better integration to supporting straight ANSI standard SQL. 
So there's a lot of benefits I talked about from the business analyst perspective. There's also some benefits to the data administrator. So a lot of other tools out there will require external tables or creating these manual views and replication of data between the systems to be able to access data within Hadoop from the SQL interface. What we're talking about is leveraging the work that's in H catalog. Once that's implemented, then any changes in the data structures will be automatically and dynamically provided to the end user without needing uh, a sort of a DBA or a specialist that understands Hadoop to get involved. So we think it's a more uh, scalable model to then be able to uh, access data within Hadoop and leverage some of the out-of-the-box analytic functions that we've developed. I won't go through all of them here. Again, these slides are available, but uh, we're doing a lot to help companies do path analysis across different digital channels. We're doing some things around text analysis, sentiment analysis. We have some statistical functions there, but it's not meant to replicate what would already be done in SAS or R. It's just for uh, some of the simpler statistical functions that are out there as well as data transformation, things like sessionizing or doing web log parsing. A lot of those bulk transformations that need to be done to do analysis are also provided out of the box. So we want to be able to deliver that on top of what Hadoop is providing um, in terms of scale and, and the HDFS file system. So that's a quick view of the technology. So then the question we have with customers is, you know, that sounds really interesting, but you know, you've got Teradata, you've got Aster in this discovery platform thing. We've, we're looking at Hadoop. We're not sure how all these things come together. You know, what's your advice? How can we we figure out the best way to support the business? So what we've been building and working on is a more consultative discussion tool, really, to talk about the different data types in an organization, as well as the different workload requirements. And I won't have time to go through this in detail, but you know, we really see three different types of schema requirements, if you will, for different data types, one of which we call stable schema data, which is really um, thinking about a schema that's been defined for things like financial analysis or point of sale data, where it's a pretty known entity. That schema is not going to change as frequently as something like a web site where that design and that strategy and things like search engine optimization is driving change much more quickly. So that's an evolving schema type of application where things are a little more fluid under the hood down to format no schema. So things like text from social feeds, documents, or image processing where they have a structure. It's not that it's unstructured data, but it's just not a structure that's easily analyzable in a relational format and it doesn't fit into a schema. And then going across the top, you've got anything from data loading, storage, transformations, reporting, and analytics. So the guidance that we give kind of as what's the best approach by workload and data type is the following. So Teradata, obviously very well known for having the best SQL engine in the market, uh, built really the data warehousing category, and anything from financial reporting to analysis and point of sale data, anything that's structured data, those ETL jobs, that workflow has been built analytics out to hundreds of thousands of users. Now, we do have organizations that are looking at Hadoop for some of the structured data that doesn't have as stringent security, metadata, and data lineage requirements. It's not something that you would necessarily use to balance the books, but in terms of large scale and a place to store and um, ingest some of this data, Hadoop is becoming an area that our customers are looking at. When you talk about interactive data discovery around this, the evolving schema types of applications, Aster is the right place to do that because of the way that we can ingest web click stream on the fly. We've got things like sessionization, Apache web log parser, et cetera, and all the advanced analytic functions that I talked about earlier. Again, I don't have a ton of time, so I'm just breezing by this. There's a white paper that describes this in more detail. And then Hadoop. Hadoop fits really well, and I'll show you some numbers in terms of performance for ingesting and storing large amounts of format, no schema data, the documents, text, et cetera, where uh, you don't know the structure or you just need a place to store it. And what better place than a distributed file system where you can store all these things without having to worry about data structure and then doing some of those transformations or parsing or batch scoring uh, to, to 
refine that data and then get it into a system where you want to join it with other structured or evolving schema data to do further analysis. So again, this is a, we could spend an hour just talking about this, but it's been a really good conversation tool for us to discuss what's the best way to solve analytical problems from a customer perspective. And, you know, really backing this up, I guess, is, is some empirical evidence that we've built out together with ESG, which is a third party that does a lot of performance testing. We've spent a lot of time really thinking about how do we bring these technologies together? What are the performance characteristics of each on different data types? And what we found is that for loading data, Hadoop is extremely fast because it's a file system. It's simply copying files from one system to another. Uh, so that's a great place to land large amounts of data. It's also a great place to do data transformations because of the batch-oriented nature of the file system and the MapReduce engine that's there. Uh, that's great. But because of the way that Aster has integrated SQL with MapReduce, we can leverage the best of both worlds, and we see significant performance improvements across all the data types uh, once you get it into that analysis paradigm, as well as the development side of Aster is extremely fast and intuitive. And just a, a drill down on this is web click stream data. Now, a lot of database centers out there have talked about SQL being more performant than MapReduce processing, um, and that's, that's not a surprise. So what we're looking at here, but I want to take that a step further. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at performance of uh, web click stream data, everything from data loading, sessionization, as well as SQL queries, which is the middle blue bar, to more procedural analytics for complex analysis, which is the green bar. And we're just showing the total aggregate of all the workloads that we ran on the two systems side by side uh, over time. So in Aster, on average, things are 18x faster. Now we talked about the data loading and transformations in general being faster on Hadoop. In the case of web clickstream data, because of the out-of-the-box functions we have for some of these things, we can run them extremely fast. SQL, as I mentioned, were 33x faster, and that's not a surprise. People understand that because of you know, other studies that have been put out there. But what's interesting is more of the, the green bar and where Aster is 6x faster over Hadoop MapReduce is because of the way we're able to leverage SQL for things like group buys, sorts, counts, et cetera, but use MapReduce for the procedural processing and do all of that together in a single SQL MapReduce function and a single pass of the data. So when you talk about data discovery and stringing together lots of different types of queries over time to figure out what's the value in this data, that's a process. That's not a single query. So, you know, when you consume, when you add these things up over time, um, there's a huge benefit in terms of being able to do uh, these things at scale very, very quickly. So I want to try and keep it down to 20 minutes, I think I'm at that mark already. So yeah, this example shows the dialect for SQL MapReduce. I won't take you through everything in detail, but we're using SQL to do things like selecting from a table. Uh, from this table is NPath, where we're taking the click state of a web click stream, and then we can do group buys, order buys, et cetera. So we're using SQL. MapReduce processing happens in the back end, and we can identify patterns like re uh, ignoring irrelevant pages across the click stream. We can define all that at the SQL layer. We can instantiate that through a BI tool and give that business analyst the ability to leverage MapReduce processing without having to worry about the coding because it's all hidden behind the scenes. And then what that allows is for somebody to take a, a blob of a mess like this across all the digital channels looking for paths to purchase and filter down and take out the noise through simple pattern definition and regular expressions within SQL so that you can identify the best channel to drive conversions on your website in this case. So this is a very simple example. I'm going to skip over uh, a couple of these slides here so we can we move on. Uh, but I will talk about one example use case. We have a couple customers that are using Aster together with Hadoop. And in this case, we've got a, a company that's ingesting large amounts of ad server data. And they're trying to figure out for our clients, what are the best digital channels for them to reach their segmented audience. So they leverage the scale of Hadoop to ingest those ad server logs. They transform that into cookie-level data. They move it into Aster, where they're then joining that with web clickstream, aggregated data about what 
spend has been through different digital channels as well as custom data from the client. And then the analyst is using a BI tool to discover what are the best marketing channels for this organization used to reach their audience. So they're doing segmentation and uh, pathing analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an example of how these technologies work together to get the best of both worlds, worlds in terms of cost, scale, and analytic performance um, by leveraging some of the integrations and the, the value that I just talked about. So with that, I will close out and say that um, you know, big data is a fast evolving market. Hadoop is a good new technology that's out there and Teradata is really focused on how to leverage those new innovations and bring the most value to our clients. We've also done a lot with the Aster product in terms of building out the analytic functions um, that companies can use to solve specific business problems and really bring data science to the business analysts without having to buy new application layers or train a bunch of people up on new technologies. And it's really about bringing these things together to provide the best of breed approach for customers. And if you've got questions on it, there's a, a little link there for you. So I'll kind of pause there and turn things over to, to John O'Brien. Okay, John, I went ahead and made you the presenter, so go right ahead. Okay. Well, um, thank you for that, Steve. It was uh, uh, There's a lot to take in, and I'm sure a lot of people are downloading that PDF. So um, let's jump into uh, some of the information and background. What I wanted to do first was uh, talk a little bit about um, the article that we recently released um, on the Bloor Group through Insight Analysis. So that uh, the summary of, of that um, article really is just to describe kind of the point of view that um, I have on a lot of these topics. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, I've been in the industry about 25 years, uh, most of that at companies as well as um, quite a bit of it at um, as a vendor, just like Steve, as a CTO for Datopia for about five years, and then also as the advisory services in the last few years coming back out into the market, so as an analyst. Um, I think also like Steve, I also have that I noticed uh, we both have kind of engineering undergraduates with uh, MBAs. So that's kind of a perspective. Now, if I jump into the article, when I was talking about um, – bridging this great divide between unstructured and structured data. One of the things that I see at companies time and time again, this was really the, the whole concept of context and where does context live. Uh, we know that in the structured world we have analysts and data modelers who work with the business, understand, model that, persist the structure, and we populate that structure with data. And what we've done there is really put context in one place so that many, many people through standardized tool can leverage that context. And that's the, the yesterday of, of the BI world, if you will. We've gotten a little bit more agile, if you will, by putting abstraction layers on top of our physical databases so it's easier to build these mappings because they're more flexible, they're easier to change, they're easier to adapt to the rate of change of business. And more importantly, they're also able to deal with multiple contexts. Uh, I still hear in many companies the whole uh, multiple perspectives of the truth or the one version of the truth. So this is part of the structured world that we lived in. In Hadoop or in the unstructured world, one of the things that's great about that, there's lots of great things about the Hadoop platform, but one of them from a rigid perspective, because it's not as mature as some of the other relational database technologies, it was actually born out of a need to work with information in a different way. And one of those needs was not, you know, knowing the context or discovering the context. In this case, the context we want to try out lives in, you know, the brains of users, end users, developers, data scientists, who use a variety of different MapReduce uh, interfaces to query the Hadoop platform. It's rigid in the sense that we're dependent on very few people in the enterprise that can do that. Um, and what we want to do, of course, is always unleash this value, which means you know, the latest release we've been waiting for uh, from Hadoop, which is H Catalog, really does open that up. So while all of those uh, different interfaces get to leverage it, uh, the users now have a shared context. No longer is the pig programmer uh, working within a context that's individualized separately from Hive or other MapReduce programmers. And once again, I mean, I won't get into the details, but within Hive, you still have somebody setting up that H 
uh, catalog contact. So we'll ask that question a little bit later. The one thing that I've seen many times and, and believe very much in is that if you really want to unlock the value in any enterprise, you have to get more people using the information and the data that's available. Uh, when you're constrained to the power users or the data scientists, um, you get value, but you know it does flatten out over time. If you can unleash that and open it up for more and more users within the enterprise, now you're going to hit that hockey stick uh, curve of value that gets unleashed, the individuals who can go in and, and work with information because it's made available. Their BI tools and their database platforms um, now have access to that. So that's where the value really comes in. If you want to unlock this, you have to open up these you know, platforms to more and more users. Uh, one of the things that we have been seeing um, in the companies that we visit and, and work with is the fact that context may not always be known, uh, meaning I can't get the business rules. I'm talking to one group who views things in one way. Uh, we're not sure, which is the whole kind of iterative process. And one of the things that's really opened up in BI recently is this discovery as a formal uh, process and workload within uh, the BI process. So. We've got discover, try out a context, very quickly abstracted in something like H catalog or an abstraction layer, try it out, iterate, verify it. If it works, keep it, maybe bring it into the structured world. You know, step one, step two. And, and I see a lot of companies doing requirements discovery, business rule discovery, or context discovery in this kind of two-step process where we work very closely with the business, iterate very quickly, identify things of context and value for the larger organizations, and then we push out that shared context away from individual context. And then finally, uh, this is just one of the a slide of architecture that, you know, in talking to companies we see um, being discussed and being implemented across uh, many companies who have both had a structured data warehouse for many years. They've stood up in the last year or two their own Hadoop environment. And now they're looking for ways to integrate the two. We're coming back to a, a nice single business intelligence platform that's one part data warehouse, one part discovery, unstructured data, analytic models. And H Catalog is a nice place to centralize that. Um, just going through this slide real quick, we have a data warehouse, right hand side, optimized workloads, different data marts and technologies there designed to do what they do best, benefits from a shared context world. And then on the left-hand side, we've got the Hadoop, which is massive scalability, lowest cost commodity basis, and handles complexity very, very well thanks to MapReduce. So some companies are taking a look at the first one that's up for discussion and how do we integrate the two is where do I take my staging area? Should I just bring it all into the Hadoop environment and pull it back out through the H catalog? My data integration tools or databases can pull and filter data into the data warehouse or staging? Or do I keep the two separate? Does my ETL go from a staging? Or maybe my ETL can now come from MapReduce programs that leverage the H catalog, or in this case, SQL H. So you can see here we are getting this you know, undiscovered context, shared context, the unstructured world and the structured world. And this is where companies today um, that we visit are actually looking at. So it's. Um, this is kind of our perspective, the companies we talk to quite often. Um, so what I wanted to do really was to jump in some of the questions that I had. Um, this is a summary of just those four slides. But let's jump into some of the questions I had for Steve. I mean, I just saw his presentation earlier today, and I jotted down some questions. Um, so why don't we get into some of the nuts and bolts here real quick. Um, so one of the first questions I noticed is that on that right and left-hand slide we saw earlier that uh, Teradata and after, Teradata After are really comparing the two as one's a discovery platform um, and the other one's kind of the integrated data warehouse. And one of the first questions I remember, of course, from After Data in the pre-Teradata acquisition was that it was really an analytic engine platform for doing a great job at executing MapReduce programs and complex analytics. So I just wanted a little maybe clarification. I mean, does Teradata view the after environment strictly as a, a data discovery platform and kind of that two-step process now? Yeah, I'd say that 
nothing's functionally changed in terms of what the platform excels at. It excels at analytics. And I think the, the notion of data discovery is really more of how our customers are using the technology is to find new insights in different types of data that they may have uh, sort of shrugged off as not valuable enough to store in the data warehouse or too expensive to store in some cases. And uh, But it takes the analytics, and there's an analytic engine, if you will, within Aster that allows people to do that, the data discovery process in a more iterative and speed of thought uh, concept. So it's really just kind of a le relabeling of the technology itself, if that answers the question. Yeah, I, um, I think so. I So for, you know, the people listening in, I wanted to clarify that, you know, it's a discovery platform, but I, I assumed that you guys were also um, keeping it or maintaining it as a real analytics platform as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the MapReduce, and, and especially with the uh, the library of all the MapReduce functions you have, and, and that being its strength. So, um, the other one um, is there any difference, or you know, in the semantics between Teradata's vision of an integrated data warehouse? Um, we've heard enterprise warehouse, we've heard the active data warehouse. So, mm -hmm. is integrated data warehouse kind of the new? vision word, if you will, for, um, you know, an analytic platform that includes, you know, Aster and Hadoop, because what we're seeing here are three different components, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering how does Teradata feel about, you know, the data warehouse? Is it all three components? Is it the entire platform and analytics, or is it the integrated data warehouse, and it has two complementary pieces? Yeah, so I'd say that Teradata views all these systems as an analytical ecosystem. So, you know, there's more than three systems in most organizations. There's probably 18 or 20, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but specific to the Teradata products and Hadoop, you know, we describe that as a unified big data architecture and that for big data, you're going to use a combination of Teradata and the integrated data warehouse, which is really focused on SQL analytics and integrating data across multiple business units or subject matters. Um, so this concept of an enterprise data warehouse and sort of one system to rule them all, I think that's something that uh, the reality is is that there's just a, a much more fluid technology landscape out there. So I think what you're seeing from Teradata is that the integrated data warehouse is really how we describe the Teradata database technology and, and sort of how that fits in. And yes, it's an analytic platform, if you will, but it's really focused on SQL analytics, whereas Aster is a separate system focused on data discovery. It's not going to provide the uh, sort of, you know, enterprise reach of a data warehouse that has dynamic workload management for thousands of users. I think in some cases the data warehouse is becoming an operational system that powers, you know, supply chains and financials and all these different uh, subject data is within the business. Um, Aster is really not focused on that. We're focused on more of data discovery and the analytics. And then Hadoop, I think, is a, a great new technology to leverage the scale and the cost infrastructure and the file system, really, to be able to ingest these different data types um, as really, as I said, a staging or a refining area to process that at scale into a format that's consumable and analyzable um, by the Teradata systems or, you know, other systems that you may have in your organization. So that's not full, so, but that's how we think about it. Yeah, so the way it's drawn on, I believe it looks like uh, the slide that we had with the Terrified Unida Unified Big Data Architecture, there's also an arrow that goes from Hadoop to the Teradata Integrated Data Warehouse. Mm -hmm. Does that connection exist, or is that via the SQL H? That connection does exist. That is not a SQL H connection today. It's a bulk data transfer connector. Okay. Um, there's a couple couple different ways that Teradata integrates with Hadoop. Uh, one of those is a commercially supported capability called the Scoop connector from right. Cloudera. Yep. Yeah, I think the Scoop and the JDBC connections, um, I think you mentioned the other white paper that you guys put out with Hadoop uh, went into some details with that. So I, I've seen that one earlier as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes a lot of sense for me as well. Um, I think of Hadoop as a great 
low cost to store all this data. And one of the things we talked about in our article as well is that, you know, if you don't know, if you can bring in all the data, but if you don't know the context, then you don't know the value, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's a great place to bring everything in to discover context, to discover mm -hmm. value, and decide where it needs to go from there. Um, one of the things that we've seen kind of differentiate in our clients also is this concept between analytics and SQL analytics and then the concept of advanced analytics. And I can see the Aster platform serving well there. So a couple other quick questions here. Um, who defines or how, uh, does the H catalog need to be defined before, you know, uh, SQL H can be run against it? Yeah, so that's a... That's a, a, a one-time setup, if you will. I've never administered H catalog myself personally, but it is something that would be set up, and then it provides that data dictionary across the different Hadoop projects. So it's really a mapping to know where data is stored in the different directories and subdirectories within HDFS. So okay. uh, once that's set up, then when we access it, and it looks to like just another table uh, within the uh, the Aster. SQL or SQL MapReduce interface. Okay, and then once uh, that that needs to be set up before we can leverage SQL H, and then mm -hmm. once we have that in place, we leverage SQL H. When you're deciding to bring data into uh, After, do you bring data into After via that connection? So yeah. So in the refinement, mm -hmm. you, you bring like, okay, we've got a an H catalog table. We want to now bring that into After so we can continue daily wise or real time processing our analytic model. Um, do you bring that into the same table that matches the definition within H catalog? Then what we so there's two ways to do it. Um, say what you're referring to is a way that we access data from Hadoop on the fly using H catalog and our, our connector really, which is SQL H. So the analyst may not even know the data is coming from Hadoop, but as part of their SQL construct, they're saying select from table called clicks, and that clicks table may be in Hadoop. Uh, that data will come in at query runtime into memory within Aster. Uh, it will be joined with other data that may be persisted within Aster specifically, and is you know in those tables, and the and the the query is run, and it's all stored in memory, and persisted there. Now, if the analyst says, "Well, I want to take that data, and persist it long term in, in Aster because I want to continue to iterate on that for a, a series of queries," that may be a good option, and they can just do a create table, and yeah, put that I was thinking that they might want to incrementally refine, like you guys say, filter refine. Mm -hmm. And, and find based on this model a set of data that they want to just add to every day and then join and run other you know analytics on that. So I didn't know if when they did that they brought it into I guess they can bring it into any table structure they want within after, right? Correct. And the yep. main thing is I think we're bringing it from the unstructured world via an abstraction definition into the structured world. And I wanted to make sure that we weren't bringing mm -hmm. in you know key value pairs into after data and, and executing that way. Nope, nope, you're right. Okay. It's leveraging the relational uh, foundation. Yeah. Have you seen whether or not companies take the output of some of those analytic models and then persist that as well within Aster or bring it back into Teradata to be used operationally? Or is it all on the fly, kind of call and calculate on the run? Do they kind of do this materialized view version, if you will, of the analytic model? Yeah, you could persist the model. And we do things like in database scoring within Aster, and, and companies could use Aster to do just reporting and analysis, you know, within a small group as well within the organization. But when you talk about integrating data and taking some of those new insights from a new channel, let's say your your web clickstream channel, and you already have a let's say a scoring mechanism within Teradata across, you know, your point of sale data and other information, it makes sense to join it there. Mm -hmm. And serve the you know hundreds or thousands of users that are leveraging that information from the data warehouse where you've got the dynamic workload management, uh, security, metadata, all those things. So um, that's really how we see the things working together. And I think you know I think that's how it works. Okay. 
Um, so, that, I mean, that makes sense. I'm just thinking through the flows that we see in a lot mm -hmm. of companies. And, and for Eric, um, I know that I've got a couple more questions. I just want to do a time check with us real quick. You can keep going. Okay, go, great. Go great, great. I mean, I, I saw some of the questions pop up, and I, I think they're some of the ones I was asking as well. So I, I think we're taking those into account. Um, one of the other things I wanted to understand and distinguish is SQL H coming out of the Aster environment, working with H Catalog now, will end up working for a lot of companies that already have Hadoop with Hive in a very similar fashion, where they have Hive and they have the abstraction layer there. They might move it to H Catalog now. Um, I think, I'm assuming here, that we're saying for those people with Hive moving to something like an Aster, you get the additional benefits of your, your portfolio um, tool, which has all the pre-canned libraries that I know, like 50-some-odd programs, as well as you know an environment that's probably more scalable than a lot of Hive environments. Does that sound about right, or is there other things in there as well? Yeah, I think you've hit on a couple of the points. I think what we're also seeing in some of our initial performance testing is that the way we access data using SQL H from HDFS bypasses a lot of the latency that Hive creates through the way that it translates Hive QL to MapReduce jobs. So we're also seeing a performance improvement in terms of this integration. Um, you know, and for people that really want to drill into this in a lot deeper detail, I will just put in a quick plug. There is a webcast we're doing tomorrow, actually with Hortonworks directly talking about this integration with H Catalog and SQL H. We'll actually be showing a live demonstration of how it works. So if people really are interested in this, you can just go to our website and register for that webcast tomorrow as well. Uh, but I think you hit on it in terms of um, you know, some of the scale and uh, performance characteristics was a bit I wanted to also highlight. Yeah, and that's kind of one of the things I was trying to get clarification on as well, that once we have an analytic model in the MapReduce framework, Within SQL H, I mean, we're basically pulling back the data into the Aster environment in memory to execute it there versus taking the model through the map reduce kind of translation and then executing within the HDFS, right? I mean, the analytic model gets ex executed now in mm -hmm. Aster, not in the HDFS. That's correct. That's and correct. so it, it operates that in memory, but a lot of the filtering, joining, and and things that you want to do at scale happen, you know, at the file system, and then what the rest gets, the actual models get executed in after in memory. Then, ah, uh, yeah, I see your point. So, we are leveraging HDFS in terms of, you know, being able to filter and uh, just bring back what's needed, and then a lot of the processing, if you will, or analytics is being done with an after. Yeah, because that's what I was wondering is how much of the model do we push down to the parallel, the HDFS environment, and how much of the workload do we keep back in our environment? But you've kind of got almost a, a two-tiered MPP mm -hmm. environment going, a low-level MPP and a high-level MPP. So um, that yeah, makes sense. And that's why I wanted to clarify that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I think one of the, the last main questions I had was related to some of the statistics and the performance numbers that were in there. And it, and it came back to I don't think we need a, a real answer or details around sizing of the environments. But I know that in a lot of companies I go to, when we look at performance statistics, they can look at something and go, oh, Hadoop is um, you know, twice as slow as this other environment. Well, I can just double the number of nodes and I pick up the performance because it is very linear in commodity. Um, any thoughts around those in the Hadoop environment that say it's cheaper and more effective to double, triple, or quadruple the number of my nodes for picking up linear performance versus moving it to a different environment and technology? Yeah, and that's certainly something to consider. I'd say that you know not every company out there is going to buy three systems to solve their problems, but you know, a lot of the larger enterprises we talk to, when they need to make trade-offs, and you just talk about power, space, and cooling, if you need to build out a, a cluster that has 5 to 10x more hardware, um, you know, that there's some costs associated with that. And, you know, the other is there are costs associated with 
development time and productivity and you know, are you going to buy new application layers on top of that that new infrastructure you're putting in some of those things so there's a lot of factors that go into it I think you know there's a lot of great um, points to be made in terms of the the cost of commodity hardware and, and just throwing more hardware at the problem but that's not always the best way to, to solve the problem so you really need to think through all the variables and you know I think the more we consult with our customers and help them come up with the right solution the better we don't necessarily want to prescribe one technique over the other. We just want to make sure we solve the problem in the most cost-effective way. Yeah, and actually, uh, you know, that's kind of the way that I answer the question for a lot of people as well. Um, the economics of it, you know, we can look at three, four, five-year total cost of ownership on a data center for, you know, volume, heating, and cooling, and, you know, acquisition costs can become negligible in some cases compared to a technology. Definitely ease of use and, like we said, you know, being able to get your technology out to the most people with the fewest number of layers is very important. So um, I think this goes back into kind of a closing thing about uh, the last two questions I had is one. But it looks like, you know, Teradata is really kind of embracing this optimized workload-specific approach to architecture, which is use Hadoop in the right way, use the Aster platform in the right way, what it's best at and, and optimized, and use the, the Teradata integrated data warehouse for what it's been proven and, and is best at as well. So um, I, does that really where Teradata is kind of saying that we are recognizing optimized workloads, including discovery? Absolutely. I think technology evolves. I think the, the point of view of, of Teradata has evolved. and. Um, as I mentioned, I think the data, the, the data warehouse and what it is and how it supports the business has evolved as well. And I think this idea that it's become more of a mission-critical operational application is interesting. And, and in some cases, you know, there's this gap, if you will, to be able to do data discovery um, that I think Aster plugs really nicely. And then there's a huge amount of value that, that systems like Hadoop can bring to that to help bring the overall cost and scale uh, part of the and equation. For, yep. And for a yep. lot of our, you know, people who are, are listening on this call or listening to the rebroadcast, I mean, for me being in the industry for such a long time, I think that evolutionary step for Teradata is quite profound. Um, it's only a few times in the history of Teradata have steps this big been made. Um, so that's why I keep asking it, just not that I'm in shock, <laughs> but um, it's it's a very – nice thing to see that Teradata has taken this approach for its future. Um, my last question, which is probably a really quick yes or no, I hope, um, does the Aster platform support uh, the Open Standards Predictive Markup Modeling Language, uh, PMML, and does it plan to? Uh, the honest answer is I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Uh, I believe a lot of that we would do through BI uh, partners and tools and our relationships with SAS and others, but um, I would have to follow up on that. Okay. Yeah, I I see this as part of that discovery where people are talking about interoperable models where I can go into SAS, develop a model there, but then I can bring it into another NPP platform like Aster and execute it there, which is simply an export of my model without having to rewrite it and import it into Aster. So. It's early. I mean, PMML has been around for a long time, but vendor adoption is kind of one of those things gradually happening. So I thought I'd throw in a quick uh, question there. But for me, I mean, I could definitely talk to Steve all day long. I've got lots and lots of questions and conversational stuff. I'm sure we could share a lot of stories as well. But, Eric, I wanted to thank everybody and keep us on schedule here. Well, hey, a lot of really, really good questions there. We just have a couple more specifics and. Steve, you've kind of talked to some of these issues, but maybe we'll just offer a little bit more perspective mm -hmm. here. And uh, if either of you have to drop off, just, just let me know. I know we're going over time now, but we'll try to just go a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So one of the attendees has a really good observation on uh, noting MapReduce is predicated on bursting content, rows, text, et cetera, into key value pairs, which is great for unstructured data. But how does Astro Data use that approach effectively for efficiently structured row data in, in the sort of classic structured environment? Well, we don't store the data as a key value pair. Um, 
we have to put it into a into a table. Now we could take a data type and store it as a binary object and then sort of stream it through a MapReduce job in memory, if you will. Um, but if there is an ability to, to structure some of that data, we'll see performance improvements in terms of how we, we grab that data. So an example of that is a web log where you have an IP address and a timestamp uh, which are pretty much you know, structured data that you could put into a table, but then you have this long URL string, which is something that we would store um, you know, as, a, as a binary, really, and then we could sort of define structure on the fly within the, the SQL MapReduce function to be able to do that analysis. So um, I may not be understanding the question 100%, but, but hopefully that's addressed uh, how we would do it within our system versus uh, a file system. Yeah, I, I think you did address and There are actually several questions that are all differently worded, but really focused on the same thing. And, and John, I think you're, you were kind of commenting on that as well. So it's basically how do you use this new framework to, uh, to do new things with the old world of, of structured data, essentially. Yeah. And, and I think that's where the value really comes in. You can just bring it into Hadoop, um, let it pour in, burst in, um, as the key value pairs, and then come back and iterate and discover what is that structure in the H catalog area. And once we discover what fits and works and has value, then we can open it up and people can start accessing it. So that's the beauty of that flexibility with that abstraction layer. And, and John, I'll just bring you in real quick here again. I put up this slide because I think this was speaking to what you were talking about, and this really is now a, a much more comprehensive matrix for understanding where certain kinds of data fit and where certain specific tools are best used and so forth. Is that is that your take as well? Yeah, it, it's a, it, it's pretty profound to me. Um, I'm, I'm very happy about it. Um, we all wondered what Teradata was going to do with the after data acquisition. Um, some of us thought that uh, it was going to get integrated into the mothership of Teradata database, and <laughs> some people believed it was going to be you know, kind of hardened and, and well integrated into this ecosystem. So um, I, am one, I very much believe in an, an optimized workload approach. It's what we work with all our clients on developing. Um, now we have more tools to choose from. And okay, good. And just using one the right tool, right? Oh yes. Uh huh. And uh, Steve, I know you kind of talked about this earlier, but I think we had someone who came a bit late and just has a very specific question. I think would be helpful for folks. Simply asking, uh, is SQL H a proprietary version of HiveQL? No, it's uh, really has very little to do with Hive in terms of the interface. Um, each catalog is really the way that data could be stored in, in Hive or, or Pig and other things. It's just a mechanism for us to access that data um, and, and do the analysis in the Aster layer. So I guess to answer the question, each catalog is the pure open source version. Um, we're not doing anything proprietary on that side. What is proprietary, though, is the SQL MapReduce framework and the way that we've integrated with H catalog. So if you want to leverage sort of the SQL interface and the, the analytic functions that Aster has, you'll need the Aster technology. Now it's freely available as a, a free download. At, it's called Aster Express, so you can download it, begin to play with it, um, connect it up to data in Hadoop if you like, and those types of things. But uh, at sort of at performance or, or at production, you'll need a, a license of it. Yeah, and I think that's really what represents the bridge, if you will, between that structured and unstructured world, because we're trying to bring the, the SQL-based world and the unstructured and the you know relational database engines in an MPP framework, and that's really where they intersect, which is um, uh, I believe Teradata has, I've seen in the past some white papers that say, and for me this was a big question, you know, coming out of the MPP world as well, is it just a user-defined function? Is it just a table call? And it really is much more than just a user-defined function that's pushed into the database and callable. Um, it is much more in a true MapReduce framework, which um, Teradata has done a nice job with. Okay, great. Well, folks, a lot of really good questions from our audience. A lot of great questions from you, John. You did a good job of uh, synthesizing some of the questions that came in from the audience. but. Obviously, we're going to hear a lot more about this stuff in the future, folks. We are standing on the precipice of a very significant shift in the industry in terms of how we solve these problems and which tools we use and 
Knock on wood, I feel that the open source movement is really being embraced by a lot of the big investors. I think that's, uh, that's good news in the world of enterprise technology because the more accessible this stuff is, the better it is for all of us. And, of course, the more interoperable it is, the better for everybody. So you can see we have some upcoming, upcoming topics here, integration next month, database, cloud, and then innovators in December. The EdCal for 2013, at least January through August, is done, and that will be out very, very soon. Keep your eyes peeled for that. And uh, with that, folks, we will thank you so much for your time and attention. A great event today. Thanks to Teradata and their uh, friends from Aster Data, now part of Teradata, of course, and John O'Brien from Radiant Advisors. We'll catch up to you next week, and we'll talk all about uh, acting and specialized database technologies and how they facilitate analytics. So with that, we're going to end the event, folks. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye.